Folks, we want to welcome you to the ministry of Upper Kingsclere Baptist Church. Um, we again today are coming to you with the Word of God and pray that God's Word will just uh, capture our hearts, our mind, our spirit in these special days we are living in. A couple of things. want to just pass this information to those who are not able to come to church or who are away and listening to the message online. We just want you to be aware we are going to have a, a conference here end of September starting from the 24th of September. We're going to have uh, Pastor John McGregor coming to us from out west to do a couple of days of special services with us. And we want to invite you first to invite you to begin a time of prayer Pray that God will take this moment and uh, just to lift our hearts up towards heaven as he sends his servant to us. Uh, first, it's going to be prayer, and uh, we would solicit all the prayer we can get from everyone uh, associated with this body of believers. And then also, not only pray, but also in our giving, because this will be an extra expense uh, for our church, but also not just time to spend extra money in these difficult days, but also to pray for souls that will be touched in our giving. Let us be also very methodical that it will reap a harvest of souls unto our God. So you have family, you have got friends, maybe it's a time to alert them and to invite them for this uh, conference that we are going to have the end of September. That's all the announcement I've got. Um, with that, I just want to again bring your attention to God's Word. We are studying through the book of Revelation. With all that has happened in our world and all that is happening every day, there is something new that's happening. In fact, I just uh, got a report that we have been on the brink of World War III uh, because of some of our politicians and their acts and behavior. So yes, the world is always on the threat of the looming disaster that's waiting around the corner. And we as believers need to know how to live during these days. With that, I want to begin our scripture reading. And today I want to read from Revelation chapter 1, which I'm preaching through. And it's important because of what this uh, scripture is saying to us. So would you take a moment and if you've got your Bible, open to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to read the entire chapter. I know it takes a little time, but God's word is important. And that's what we are gathering here for. So will you take your Bible and open to Revelation chapter 1 as I read? Uh, please take note of the word of God. And let it just minister to your heart, to your mind, and to your spirit. It begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings of, on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will, chase, will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation, 
and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, who are on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like a roar of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. From his mouth came the sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore these things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, are the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. May God add a blessing to his word. Would you bow with me for a brief word of prayer? Father, we take these few moments on this beautiful day to come in your presence allowing your Holy Spirit to illumine our mind, our hearts, and our spirit. For, Father, the things we have read are things that are finite, are infinite. We are finite people. Our understanding is so shallow. Our mind can only take so much. And, Father, there are depths in your word today that no man can come to understand it fully without the help of the Holy Spirit. So we are praying that you allow your Holy Spirit to open our minds, our hearts, and our spirit, that we may draw near to you as you have drawn near to us. Speak to us, Lord. Help us that we may hear, understand, and apply this truth to our hearts in these days that you've given to us. We also want to pray for our country. Father, thank you for blessing us to live in one of the most wonderful parts of your creation. Thank you for the blessing that we see all around us. Father, we are not naive to see that there's fires that's looming in a lot of places with great destruction. There's also flooding, uh, Father, where lives have been lost. And then there's also places where it is absolutely dry and the drought has caught on and devastated uh, the lives of many people. Yet here... You have blessed us with bountiful of rain and moisture. We see the greenery around us. Thank you, Father, for your grace over our lives. We just want to pray for those that are suffering among the brethren all over the world that are facing the very sword of men because of the word of Christ. Just as our brother John was on the island of Patmos, incarcerated there, sent away from his churches. Yet even there you would use him mightily to pen some of the most wonderful words, words of hope and joy and everlasting peace. Father, we just want to pray today, even as we pray for our loved ones who are laid up in hospitals, those who are laid up with various illnesses. Some are home, some are in the hospitals. And Father, we pray for your hand of mercy and grace to be upon them, that you reach out and touch and bring healing. Father, there are many of us who maybe are sitting in the pews, 
that need an inner healing. There's doubt, there's fear, there's anger, there's resentment. There's all those things, Lord, that the enemy wants to take advantage of. So we are coming to you and say, Lord, lift us up. Remove those hurts and pains that has been meted out to us, that we may live in freedom, that our mind may be able to come and draw near with our heart, with our mind, with our spirit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great healer. We also want to pray for our country. Father, we pray for our leaders. Give us men and women that will know how to lead this country. It's a beautiful country, Lord. There's so much blessings. And Father, we just pray that you give us men and women that know you, that love you, that will lead us. Now, Father, we just pray as we take these few moments uh, to look into your word. Speak to our hearts. Let your Holy Spirit open our minds, our hearts, our spirit, that we may understand your word, apply the truth, and live holy lives before your great and wonderful day when you come and claim us to yourself. Until then, Father, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, want to take... This is the third part of the message, Visions of God. And uh, today we want to again focus back on chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. We have gone from verse to verse. Today the concentration will be verses 7 to verse 20. It's a lengthy passage. There's so much in these passages. So I will not waste a lot of time. I just want to begin first with the consummation of the age. And then the characteristic, the character of the age. The consummation of the age and the character of the age. Beginning with the consummation of the age, verses 7 and 8. I'm going to read the text again, uh, just to keep in context. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. First, there are a couple of things I want us to see in verse 7. First, we see the eventual triumph of Jesus. Behold, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. You see, the end is so wonderfully good. The Bible says, Behold, he says, he cometh on the clouds. Our Lord and Savior is coming. How are we to understand that in today's day and age? Look around you and look at the evil that's being paraded before our face every day. Not only is evil being paraded, but we see the very innocent ones, even children, are being pulled into this evil agenda of this world. So let me take God's word and remind my own heart and remind you, what is the Bible saying to us? Well, we've been given through the word that John received in the island of Patmos that he's coming. That is the eventual triumph of Jesus. There are going to be two Interesting things during the eventual triumph of Jesus from verse 7. First will be visible. Every eye will see him. You see the clouds are the, glow, uh, the clothing of his glory. He clothed himself in the pillar of cloud. Remember when God led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Taking them to the promised land. There was a pillar of cloud. Not only that. He shrouded himself in the cloud, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness. Remember when they built the temporary uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. God shrouded himself in the cloud. And then let's not forget when we see the last time when Jesus, before his second coming, is taken up in glory. The Bible tells us Christ was lifted up in the cloud during his ascensions. And it also reminds us when he returns physically, he comes with the cloud. It'll be visible. 
Now we know we, we say, oh, you know, it's the day of internet and you can see things happening on the other side of the world because of internet. I don't think so. God needs the internet for every eye to see his son, Jesus Christ. I think it would be a great miraculous day that God is going to perform, that every eye will see him. He does not need help from men. He does not need men's ingenuity to make it possible for every eye to see him. So it will be visible. Every eye will see him. But it will also be victorious. All the earth will wail. And every eye will see him. The enemies will drop to their knees and weep. All Israel will see their Messiah whom they had rejected appearing in glory, power and majesty. Yes, the mark of his wounds will be visible. Because the Bible says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So there we have it. The eventual triumph of Jesus will be visible, it will be victorious. Secondly, the everlasting triumph of Jesus. The everlasting. See, this is the eventual triumph, verse 7. Now we see the everlasting triumph of Jesus, verse 8. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. And then it finishes with this word, the Almighty. The Almighty. You see, the everlasting triumph of Jesus is based on three great attributes of God. Now these are big words, but I will make it as simple as possible. First, he is omniscient. That means he is all-knowing. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, Jesus Christ is God's alphabet. Remember how John starts his uh, gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the word was God. So here we see he's God's alphabet, the word. He's the first and the final source of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. There is no greater source of knowledge or understanding or wisdom. It's all embodied in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You see, his decrees are based on his omniscience, all-knowing. He cannot be deceived, disputed, discredited, or disconcerted. He came first time to redeem. He comes the second time to reign. To reign on earth. The Bible talks about thousand year, uh, years of reign of Christ. What we call the millennium. His dictates will be full inexhaustible and wise based on the infallible knowledge of all the facts. There is nothing we can teach Christ. He knows it all. He's omniscient. That's why the Bible says he's the first and final source of knowledge, understanding and wisdom. Not only is he omniscient, he's omnipresent. He says, I'm the beginning and the end. Here it is steady in terms of time, but it is just as true in terms of space. Matthew 18, 20. The Lord is present in the midst of any company of his people in any part of the world at any given moment of time. Remember Jesus' promise he gave to us from Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always, he says, even to the end of the world. His presence is is always with us. He's omnipresent. Thirdly, he's omnipotent. He says, I am the Lord which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Remember, we finished reading the last word in uh, verse 8, the Almighty. He is omnipotent. There is no power greater than Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, sometimes we wonder why he didn't display all that power when they put him on the cross and in the tomb. He did. He defeated sin and death. He died because of our sins. 
But then they buried him, thinking that's over with. But guess what? He rose from the dead on the third day, showing his complete power over death and sin. You see, the first part describes the Father in verse 4. That God is almighty. And now the Son also is described as the Father, the Almighty. He is God in every sense of the word. He is almighty. The expression that occurs ten times in the New Testament, nine of them in the book of Revelation. Kingdoms and nations and churches, except the raptured remnant, will fail. But God has not failed. Christ will not fail. All power in heaven and on earth belongs to him. His triumph will be eventual, but it will also be everlasting. Praise God. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. You see, the consummation of the age, the eventual triumph, which will be visible, it will be victorious, the everlasting triumph, there we see the one who is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Now we go to the character of the age, verses 9 to 20. It's an age of individual witness. It's an age of individual witness. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You see, you would think that this great apostle John, God would put him in a place of great comfort. No, he's in a place of torment and pain. He's incarcerated on this rocky little piece of real estate because his power was such came to the word of God and his love and life in the Lord Jesus Christ that the Roman government had no power to kill this man all they could do is incarcerate him without knowing that in his incarceration there in the fairs of Rome, but he'll be at the feet of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, let me say this to you, in all our suffering as a Christian, remember no matter what kind of suffering that holds you down, you are always in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget that. And John says, I join your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And then he tells us his location on the island of Patmos. Why? On the account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Do you see how today we have become so shaken up when there's a little bit of confrontation? When we think we are going to be facing any kind of tribulation or any kind of pain, boy, we skip town very quickly. John was not willing to skip town because you know what? He knew where he was. His Lord and Master Jesus is going to be there. You see, the church, as I, my understanding is from the Word of God, will not go through the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is God's judgment on this world. The time of Jacob's trouble, but I'll tell you what. The church is not exempt from the persecution. And Jesus warned us of that. You see, the great tribulation is a time when God is going to allow his covenant people to face another disastrous time of suffering just to purify them. And that's what God used suffering for, is to purify his people. That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when 
you are accounted. Either you're going to die for Christ or you're going to succumb and follow the world. As I said, the church is not going to be exempt from persecution. And Jesus warned us of that. In this world you'll have tribulation, John 16, 33. But he did not stop. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Paul also said in Acts 14, 22, we must go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. But praise God, we will not face the great tribulation that God will bring on planet Earth on Satan and those that have followed him. You see, it's an age of individual witness. It's also an age of instinctive worship. It's an age of instinctive worship. And we want to look at the, the portion of scripture, Revelation chapter one, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. What was John doing? He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I'll tell you what, he was worshipping. It was an age of instinctive worship. And the day he would worship the Lord on that island of Patmos was the Lord's day. A day surrendered to Jesus Christ. Because that's what worship is. Worship is giving worth. We are surrendering ourselves to give worth to one who is our God and King. You see, John was on the island of Patmos in the spirit. He was in the fetters of Rome. But he was at the feet of Jesus Christ. He was not only witnessing, but he was worshiping. He had a human environment in a heavenly environment. He was physically in the island of Patmos, but he was in the heavenly environment. Why? Because God's Spirit would come and give John this vision that he had to write to the churches. You see, the Lord's Day could be a day chosen by God to speak to John and give him this revelation. John will write what he heard and also what he saw. I want you to note the stages through which he passed in receiving this particular vision. I heard, I turned, verse 10. I saw, verse 12. I fell at his feet, verse 17. It was instinctive worship. Verse 11, as I read, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. What a vision! What a vision that uh, John would be able to see. Here, he's able to notice. He's able to notice as he turns, as the vision, as he gets this voice, he turns to look and what does he see? He sees the seven golden lampstands. And folks, this is very, very significant. The golden lampstands were the representation of the churches. Do you realize Jesus tells his disciple, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men will see and glorify your Father in heaven. We are supposed to be a light. And God forgive us, sometimes we display more darkness in the church than the world displays outside. So here we see some very interesting things. First is given the command to write. Write what you see in a book. And then he has to send what is written to the seven churches, physical churches that John had been a pastor to, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I believe that each of these churches are representing the churches today. 
how we function for God. And each church is going to be told what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And then they are given the command to either do what they're doing that is right or to change and do what is right. I think that warning comes to us today. You see, there follows a ninefold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, as you look at the book of Revelation, the chapter 1, it begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our eyes are turned to look at him. And then he turns our eyes to look at his church. And then the tire, tire, again he says, now, you see me, you see my church, and then turn and look at me again. So that the church is never confused who Jesus is. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And that is established in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Before you see all the carnage that we will read about and see taking place in the book of Revelation. And all that is a warning to you and I as believers. How we live. What we say. What we do. Where we go. And all those things that pertain to our lives. But also it is a clear warning how we uh, treat the church of Jesus Christ. He is very possessive of his church. Please hear me out. He is very possessive of his church. You are his church. I am a part of his church. So we need to be so careful how we deal with the church of Jesus Christ. See, there follows a ninefold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is so important for us to really uh, focus on. Because many a time we just hear about that mild and loving Jesus, the little lamb. Here we get to see the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He purchased us with his blood. The Bible writes, you have been bought by his blood. And now we come to the place where we want to look at this um, different aspects. Ninefold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go through it very briefly. First, he's the unknowable one. No longer the carpenter of Nazareth. No longer the peasant from Galilee. No longer the one who looked so simple that a lot of high mighty people would give no attention to. He's the unknowable one. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. In verse 13, And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. I want you to note his place. When John sees the vision of the lampstands, the seven lampstands, golden lampstands, who is in the middle of that lampstand is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. He is in the midst of his churches. So, Folks, let's be very clear. If the church claims the name of Jesus Christ and claims to worship him, then remember, he is in the midst of that church. I believe he is in the midst of his church that truly worship him, that lift him up high. He is present with us through his Holy Spirit. Now, what do I mean he's the knowable one? You see, when John walked with Jesus, followed Jesus on earth, even laid his head on his chest, the closeness he had with Jesus Christ, yet now he sees this same Lord and Savior in a very different light. It says, in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe 
and with a golden sash around his chest. The golden sash basically tells us his power and the pomp and the prestige that has been given to him on the right hand side of his heavenly father. Now John sees not the simple carpenter from Nazareth, but sees the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Not only that, he's the unemotional one. Note the Savior who wept at Lazarus' tomb, wept over Jerusalem, wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is about to enter into judgment. The Bible tells us, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. It's like when you're brought before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, what excuse will you have? What excuse will you make? There he will sit in judgment. There we cannot appeal to this uh, one who was emotional because there he will set out the judgment of how we've lived our lives. Not only that, he's the impeachable one. You see, the Bible says, though our sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, in Isaiah 1.18, it is so clear when Isaiah writes this word, that this Redeemer, Savior, is able to remove our sin completely and bring holiness, purity, and righteousness. You see, we see the Prince of this world cometh, He said, and he's got nothing in me. Jesus said when he was on earth that Satan is coming, but he has got no power over Jesus Christ because he was the impeachable one. There is no sin or shortcoming we can throw towards Jesus Christ. You know, in the United States, they've been trying to impeach one president after the other, and every time you turn around, there's somebody looking for a way to impeach uh, this man because they have found some, some things that they can use to impeach him. What can you find to impeach Jesus Christ? Even Satan, one of the most powerful angelic entity, could not lay anything on Jesus Christ. He's the undeceivable one. You know, it's amazing when you see the description uh, that's given to his, his eyes. His eyes. You know, when I read that, I, I just really, it's really difficult to fully explain. His eyes could bore through the heart of man. When he was on earth, remember when they brought Nathaniel to him, He told Nathaniel, Nathaniel said, what good can come from Galilee, really? Are you serious that there is a Savior and he's from Galilee? What a joke. But when Nathaniel comes near Jesus, Jesus says to Nathaniel, you are a man with no guile. And Nathaniel is shocked. And Jesus goes on to tell Nathaniel, I saw you when you were under the tree. Maybe Nathaniel was praying and meditating and Nathaniel was amazed that over the span of time and space, Jesus could see him clearly, not only physically, but also see in him a man with no guile. Remember the Samaritan woman? After an encounter with Jesus Christ, she's going to run back to town and she'll say, come see this man who has known everything about me. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 12, 25, that Jesus could even know the thoughts of the Pharisees and the scribes. See, he's the undeceivable one. His eyes would bore through the heart of men. We read in Revelation 1, 14, his hair on his head were white, like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. It could cut through. His hair was on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. That is only indicating to us not that he's an old, old man with white hair. 
it is indicating that he is the purest of the pure. Let's leave it at that. Remember in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9, Daniel would describe when he saw God in the heavens, he describes his garment was white as snow, his hair like pure wool. So we see how scripture again confirms this truth. Fifthly, he's the undeterrable one. You cannot deter Christ. You see, once the fang of the serpent would strike his feet at the cross. Remember in Genesis when God gave judgment said, you will strike the heel of the man, but he will crush your head. Now we see his feet is like burnished bronze. He can crush the serpent's head and he did on Calvary's cross. And now John gets to see his feet as burnished bronze. You know, bronze was used uh, even to make the altar for the sacrifices. That's the picture John has when he looks at the one who's undeterrable one. You see, he marched to the cross. He was buried on the tomb. And on the third day, he walked from the tomb. He's undeterrable. Neither Rome or the devil could hold him down. And in the near future, these feet of burnished bronze will render asunder even Mount Olivet. It's amazing the picture that John gets in this revelation. But it's a picture to tell us that this one who's going to come again as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he's also the unanswerable one. The Bible gives us the image, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice like the roar of many waters. Voice is the sound of many. Imagine you and I trying to argue with the Niagara Falls. I've been to Niagara Falls a number of times. One time we even took the boat and went uh, at the bottom of Niagara Falls and the roar of tons of water coming over every second was impossible even to hear yourself breathe. And here the Bible gives us a description. He's the unanswerable one. Voice is the sound of many waters. And then we see he's the unparalleled one. He's in total control of all the forces. Just like the water coming over the Niagara Falls is impossible to control. It's impossible to divert. It has set his path. The sheer volume of it will push anything out of its way. Here we see that our Savior is giving the description. He is the unparalleled one. He is in total control over all the forces. Eight, he's the unconquerable one. The Bible says, sharp two-edged sword. Remember in Hebrew, the sword is the word of God, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Here also, when you look at the idea that he's the sword of the word of God, it's very quickly to just bypass that. That means he, just like the Roman, had this sword that they would carry. And it was not a defensive weapon, for it was an offensive weapon. When he says, when the Bible tells us he's the sword of the word of God, that means he is coming to conquer his enemies. And when he comes to conquer his enemies, he's the one that is unconquerable one. Lastly, he's the unapproachable one. You know, at the best of times, when the sun is shining bright, and it happens when I'm driving back home from Fredericton, especially in the evenings, sometimes the sun is so bright when it is going to set, and it's shining right in my face, and 
I have to use very good sunglasses so I can see, but sometimes I've got to put the visor down to cut off that power of that sun. The Bible tells us he's the unapproachable one. His face like the sun. The Bible tells us in verse 16, in his right hand he held the seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. He's the unapproachable one. This is why in verse 17, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. What gentleness and love. Verse 18, And the living one, I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Isn't it amazing that this very Savior... John would fall at his feet as though dead. He's not the, the Galilean who walked in sandals. Who had even to receive food from those that would, would feed him. And have to borrow a place to even have the last supper. When John sees him. He is now the unapproachable one because of his might and his power and his grace. And the description is given to us throughout this passage. I wish we could spend more time in each of these sections, but there's a lot more, but I'm just giving you just a glimpse. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I'm the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and Hades. So you see, it's very interesting, the nine-fold description of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the unemotional one. He's the impeachable one. He's the undeceivable one. Unimpeachable, I mean, not impeachable, but unimpeachable. He's the undeceivable one. He's the undeterrable one. He's the unanswerable one. He's the unparalleled one. He's the unapproachable one. Many a times I hear brothers and sisters saying, Oh man, if Jesus was around, I'd just invite him for a cup of tea. They are still looking at him as the Galilean who walked on the dusty roads, giving stories and parables and teachings. When John sees him, there is a whole difference here. He fell at his feet as one is dead. So we see the character of the age. It's an age of instinctive worship. But also it is an age of intelligent waiting. Verses 19 and 20. John is given these words. Write therefore these things that you have seen. Those that are and those that are to take place after this. That is the outline of the book of Revelation. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. If you want a clear outline from the first chapter of the book of Revelation, it's in verse 19. There are certain times involved in unfolding of the divine purpose, times which only God can reveal. He says, right. You see, this is not something that Paul or John or anyone could come up with. This was a direct revelation from Jesus Christ. And all John could do is take the dictation and write and then send these letters to those churches. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Jesus is so particular about his church. Jesus is so possessive of his church. And why wouldn't he be? He laid his life for the church. So John is given to understand also that there are certain truths Involved in unfolding of the divine program, which only God can reveal. 
mystery of the seven stars. Here is where there must be an intelligent waiting upon God for fresh light from his word through study and prayer. You see, we get excited about the end times because we just want to know, hey, have I got my ticket and am I going to go through? You know, where, where is my seating reserved? Can I say to you, there is a lot more about the end times that you and I have to know. And that cannot come from just a, a sermon or just a message. It has to come from thorough study of the word of God, which we, God's people, need to undertake. I am even hardly scratching the surface. But it will take you to be on your knees, asking God to reveal the truth so that you can understand. You see, here is where there must be an intelligent waiting for God for fresh light from his word through study and prayer. So then I want you to see the book begins with the visions of God, particularly of God the Son. They show God in control of the course, the consummation, and the character of the age. And what do they do to you and me? They challenge us to witness, to worship, and to wait. They challenge us to worship, to witness, and to wait. You can talk about Jesus Christ when you do not know him. What do you tell the world? You have to know him through personal faith in him. You can't worship him if you don't know who he really is. Look at John, he will fall at the feet of Jesus Christ as one dead. To really worship him, it will involve your entire life, your entire curriculum, how you live, where you go, what you do, how you work, all that is included, that should be included in your worship. And then to faithfully wait. That doesn't mean just twiddling your finger uh, around the corner. While you are waiting, you are obediently serving him and loving him. And how do you serve him and love him? You are serving him in his church and you're loving the people that he has loved and died for that includes you. And that's how you wait for the great and coming king. I close with this. Question, how ready are we to embark on this journey? People get fascinated when you talk about the end times. And sometimes that fascination is not helpful. It can only be helpful if it will change how you and I will live our life before our Savior shows up. How ready are you to embark on this journey? Father, we again want to thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness. Thank you for your loving kindness. Father, let your word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bring understanding to our heart and to our mind. So in these days when there's so many things happening around the world, some very near to us. Father, we can get alarmed with the things that's happening, but help us know like John, that you are in control of every circumstance, especially pertaining to your church. And Lord, if we are your church, then we pray you will hold us, lead us, guide us, until we see you face to face. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray.